Hey, it's Dr. Cody Raw with Tech for Psych. So today I wanna to take a look at the visual centers of the brain because I think that it's a really interesting thing to think about and there's a lot of neuroscience implications there. You know, ever since humans have had a neocortex, we've been visualizing how to build our shelters better or where to hunt better. And then we also visualize about things that happened to us in the past and can see in our mind's eye scenes that we've seen and scenes that we want to see. So visualization is very, powerful process and I want to take a look at modern day neuroimaging and other devices that we have available today and hopefully in the near future and take a look at how those could be incorporated into visualization exercises to help improve what we're doing in the here and now. But really quick, if you guys haven't subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button and click that bell so you get notifications when I upload new content. I have been uploading every week. If you haven't been getting notifications about the videos that are coming out every week, it's probably because you haven't hit that bell, so make sure to do that now. Okay, so getting to visualization. Like I said, ever since humans have had a neocortex, they've been probably visualizing things for themselves, things that they would like to do, things that they would like to improve. And uh, this became very prominent in current day literature around the turn of the century. You know, people like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Napoleon Hill, these were some self-development gurus that really developed a lot of skills that people could use to uh, improve their lifestyle, things like self-affirmation, things like setting goals, and of course, things like visualization of how you would like your future to be. Uh, Tony Robbins is really big on this. Uh, Tony Robbins, as I understand, was originally trained under something called neuro-linguistic programming, which is a very popular type of self-help that really incorporates this idea of visualizing what you want and feeling inside your body the joy or the ambition of going after those goals in order to motivate yourself. So visualization can be a very powerful process. I also see visualization in therapy, in psychology and psychiatry because people, for instance, with post-traumatic stress disorder who have seen terrible things or had terrible things happen to them often re-experience these events in visual imagery. And what we're seeing from molecular biology is that when you actually recall a memory, there's a protein that's expressed, and there's about a 15 minute window there where you can actually change and reshape the memory so that when it gets laid back down in the neocortex or the hippocampus, it doesn't have the same amount of unconscious autonomic response that it has over people. You know, if you haven't read The Body Keeps Score, if you want to learn more about PTSD and trauma, that's really what happens. The, the memory sort of rewires the brain and really causes people to have nightmares or be triggered by certain things and have what we call hypervigilance. So by using visualization and sort of re-scripting over these memories, you can really calm down the autonomic process that goes along with that. So you know, multiple different examples of why visualization can be really helpful for uh, not only mental health disorders, but self-help. So it would be really cool if we had devices that were able to take a look at what we're visualizing in our minds and maybe even direct us to how we'd be able to better do that, give us directions and feedback about how we can more vividly visualize things so that we're changing things in our mind's eye, preparing us and make us even better in the here and now. So in these visualizations, you can do different things like in your mind's eye, change the contrast, maybe change the color tone, um, enlarge or even diminish certain figures or people or things within the memory. And these make the memories more powerful and seem to change the effect in physiology that they have over people. So imagine if you had a brainwave device that uh, was monitoring that process and able to guide you to be able to do it better, much like the Muse headband can guide you through a meditation. So in order to understand what's going on here, we need to take a look at what's going on in the brain in terms of visual imagery. So in order to understand this, let's take a look at the anatomy of vision in the brain and some basic physics. So light hits off objects. Those objects reflect the light in certain wavelengths. That's how we see colors and that information is transmitted from the eye to the back of your head in the occipital lobe, which gets the primary visual information. So the information that hits the occipital lobe is mostly, mostly shapes, colors, you know, basic elements of what we're seeing. And then that information gets passed up through the temporal and parietal lobes that add layers of inf information like context and um, 
memories about what you're seeing. So imagine you see a person, um, maybe the information on the occipital lobe is just the basic shape of the person, the color of their clothes and whatnot. And then that gets passed up to other brain regions that associate, okay, they're walking towards me, they're walking away from me, or this is the situation of the here and now where I'm interacting with this person and then incorporating different brain areas to add context of this is my relationship with the person, this is what we did last week, this is my goals in uh, dealing with this person. All these different things added up onto different layers of the visual imagery. So if you look at uh, Jack Gallant's lab at UCS, they did ama some amazing work with visual imagery. So they took a look at people with functional MRI machines and showed that between individuals, there's about one third overlap. So if they give them the same picture, patterns in the overall brain are one third overlap. The majority of the overlap is in the occipital lobe and then a lot of the other differences are within areas like the temporal and parietal lobes. So as you can imagine, the primary visual information is reflected in very similar brain activity, but the actual context, because the context for, context for two different people is gonna be different, the context, context layers that are added on top of that show different brain scan patterns. And Jack Gallant, of course, his lab was the ones that did this amazing experiment where they had people lay in fMRI machines for hundreds of hours and showed them YouTube videos collected the brain activation patterns in the occipital lobe from that and then used that data in machine learning to actually record just brain imaging pictures of people shown videos and have the computer reassimilate those images and show what the computer thought the people were actually seeing. Uh, Mary, Mary Lou Jepson's TED talk was on that. And of course, where I'm going with all this is, you know, it would be great to be able to see information from the brain and understand what people are seeing, but not only that, but visualizing. Uh, Giorgio Gannis's 2004 paper showed side by side that what people visualize and what people see, there's actually very similar overlaps in the brain activation patterns. So you, you would be able to actually visualize things and the computer could pick that up and, and sort of show or understand what you were trying to visualize. Uh, just recently, I, I saw a paper in which um, there was a microchip implanted on people's brains and they, they thought of uh, certain letters and the computer actually uh, translated what actually numbers they were thinking of. It was numbers, not letters. But you, we're starting to be able to do this. We're starting to be able to do some really unique and incredible brain-computer interface stuff. So what does this really take? And uh, when you take a look at the Muse headband, for example, the main information that the Muse headband is collecting is EEG, all right? So the brain is firing, there's uh, billions of neurons firing, uh, thousands of neurons firing in synchrony that cause local field potentials, and that actually changes the voltage on the scalp, which those Muse headband devices actually pick up. Uh, the problem is, even though they have uh, really good temporal resolution, meaning that you pick up the signal pretty much about the time that the neurons fire, it's not very good spatial resolution because the electrical signal gets spread out from the central uh, spinal fluid, the CSF around the brain, and you can't really pinpoint as well where the signals are coming from. So it lowers the resolution and it lowers the resolution of what you would actually need to be able to pick up what's going on in the occipital lobe. The problem with the functional MRI side of things is it has really good spatial resolution, meaning that you can pinpoint within a millimeter of where the neuronal activity is happening by measuring the blood flow in the region, but uh, the temporal resolution is, in, is good because you know the neurons fire, the blood flow shifts to prov provide the metabolism that those neurons need, but that takes a couple of seconds, so there's a lag time there. So the idea is figuring out some kind of happy medium between different techniques like that so that you would be able to have real time and good spatial resolution of a, an appropriate resolution to actually see what someone is visualizing. And that's what Mary Lou Jepson's working on with open water. Uh, she's using near-infrared uh, spectroscopy to try to use near-infrared light to shine uh, into people's heads. It, it, it does get through biological tissue without harming the tissue, but it scatters a lot, so we need a lot of um, computing power to reassimilate the image. But that's what would be really cool is if we had that type of technology to actually visualize 
you know, actually see what people are visualizing inside of their heads and use that for self-development processes like I spoke about at the beginning of, of this video and use that for therapeutic interventions like accelerated resolution therapy that utilizes visualization of traumatic events and relaying down these memories through things like neuro-linguistic programming to lessen their effect, to actually have a therapeutic effect on the person. Another route that we might go, so there's two different routes that uh, we could go with this. Either our uh, big data machine learning capabilities need to get better with EEG to the point of where we would actually be able to use EEG signals to get that kind of information, or we need better brain scan technology like an improved version of functional MRI or near infrared spectroscopy to be actually see patterns and collect information from the brain with high resolution so that we could actually see it. And it'll probably be a combination of both, right? We're improving our machine learning capabilities and we are improving our brain imaging capabilities. And when those come together into a new powerful technique, hopefully we'll be able to do this. Now, as far as uh, using the Muse headband today and visualization, I think that there's actually a lot of exercises that you can do. Unfortunately, from my experience, the Muse headband does not respond well to active visualization during the actual Muse neurofeedback sessions. It will actually tell you through the audio feedback that you've lost focus. I suspect this is because the Muse meditation algorithm was derived from expert meditators practicing mindfulness meditation with attention on the breath, which has very little activation of the visual cortex. The type of meditation the Muse headband prefers has minimal visual stimulus to promote pacification of the senses to provoke physiological state changes called jhana, which I'll talk about more in my video next week. However, this does not prevent you from doing the mindfulness meditation with the Muse headband, the one that prefers. Then, after you're done with your Muse headband meditation, visualize after the meditative exercise when you are in more of an open state of mind. I recommend doing a meditation and then when you're in that state towards the end of the meditation after you've gotten into a good alpha theta range to visualize because your mind is sort of a sponge at that point. It's really open to information coming in. So you can very heavily rewire your brain during that time and that's really what I recommend for people. Uh, meditate, get into a very deep meditative state with the Muse headband and then visualize your future. Visualize what you want. Visualize you know, the relationships that you want to have, what you want to own, what your lifestyle looks like, and really use that to set your goals and create enthusiasm for your lifestyle. This is something that I do every day. When I'm preparing, part of my morning routine is I um, say three things that I'm grateful for, visualize my future, and then go into my meditation session. And oftentimes, if I have time during the day, I will, after the meditation session, when I'm in that state, visualize again, really to lay down and cement these visualization processes. So that's a practical thing that you guys can do in the here and now to enhance visualization. And hopefully in the future, we'll have even more powerful devices to actually bring all that to fruition. Thanks so much for listening. If you guys want to do meditation training with me uh, with the Muse headband and be able to visualize like that, head to www.techforpsych.com slash coaching. Really appreciate your guys' attention. Talk to you again sometime soon.